Gwen felt something mystical in her life when she was seven years old. On a weekend, she and her parents were supposed to go mushroom picking. That night, Gwen had her first dream about the fortune teller. There was something familiar about her, as if Gwen had seen her before. The fortune teller looked serious and said not to cross the bridge tomorrow. Gwen had had various dreams before, so she didn't think much of it, although she was a little scared. The three of them set out for mushroom picking. Dad said he had heard of a great place where they could find some really good porcini mushrooms. They drove for about 40 minutes, and the car was approaching a bridge. Gwen was dozing off when her father's voice woke her up. Here's the bridge. Just as I was told, he said. Gwen instantly remembered her dream and urgently asked her dad to stop. Tom stopped the car. Sweetie, what's wrong? Tom looked at his daughter with concern. Are you feeling unwell? Olivia was worried for her child. I just got a little dizzy. Let's just wait here for a moment, Gwen replied. Of course, sweetheart. Her mom immediately opened the door and helped Gwen out of the car. Take a deep breath, it will pass. Olivia gently patted Gwen on the back while Tom stepped out of the car and marveled at the surroundings. Of course, it will pass. Look at how clean the air is here, unlike where we live. Just then, another car passed by them and drove onto the bridge, which collapsed beneath it. The car plunged into the water. Tom rushed to help the people, as did others who were passing by in their cars. They managed to rescue a man and a three-year-old boy, both with various injuries. Mushroom picking was the last thing on their minds now. Tom and Olivia provided statements to the police. The paramedic said that the injuries were of moderate severity and not life-threatening. It's a good thing Gwen felt unwell in time. We were supposed to be there, Olivia remarked. Watch your tongue. Tom scolded Olivia angrily. Don't even say that. Our child could have been dragged into all sorts of examinations. They didn't bring up the subject again. When they arrived home, Tom's hands were shaking for a long time. Gwen started to ponder her dream, but like all children her age, she gradually forgot about both her dream and the fortune teller. She didn't tell her parents about the fortune teller in her dream either. Soon, Gwen started school, and the demands of school life pushed thoughts of the fortune teller out of her mind completely. She only remembered the incident on the bridge and would ask her dad about the boy who had fallen into the river with the car. After some time, Tom told her that both the boy and his father had fully recovered and were grateful for the help they had all provided. Tom also mentioned that an investigation was underway regarding those responsible for the maintenance of the bridge. The bridge had long been in need of repairs, but for some reason, it had been delayed. Time went on, and Gwen lived a normal life. She fell in love with her peers, attended sports clubs, dreamed of the future, and expected only good things from life, just like any 17-year-old. Gwen graduated from high school and entered university. One day, as she and her friend were walking down the street after classes, it started to rain. Let's go over there, her friend pointed towards a bus stop. We can take shelter under the roof. Sure, let's do that, or else we'll get soaked, Gwen agreed with a nod. As they were about to run towards the bus stop, Gwen heard a voice deep within her subconscious. Don't go there. Gwen shuddered. The voice seemed incredibly familiar, and she realized it was the voice of the fortune teller. She grabbed her friend's hand and didn't let go. Her friend looked at her with astonishment, about to ask why Gwen was acting so strangely when suddenly, a massive truck emerged from around the corner and literally crashed into the bus stop. Luckily, the bus had just left, and there were no people waiting at the stop, or else there would have been casualties. Gwen and her friend screamed in shock. 
They called for an ambulance and the police. The truck driver was unconscious but alive. The doctor said he would survive. The girls provided their statements and then went home. The rain had already stopped, and her friend said, This is all so strange, Gwen's friend said. You grabbed my hand even before the truck appeared around the corner. Did you sense something? Gwen hesitated before responding. I caught a glimpse of the truck and just knew that something was about to happen. But no, you couldn't have seen it. I was looking in that direction too at that moment. It's strange why I didn't see it. Her friend looked at Gwen closely and expressed her gratitude for Gwen holding her hand as things could have ended very badly. Gwen returned home and collapsed onto her bed. Her eidetic memory reminded her of the image from ten years ago, and once again, she wondered where she had seen the fortune teller's face before. She spent several hours trying to recall where she might have seen it but couldn't remember. She convinced herself that the fortune teller meant no harm and was only saving her from a great disaster. Deep down, though, she still thought it might be some kind of coincidence. She remembered how Tom once mentioned that gypsies used to steal children. Olivia had laughed and said, You're living in the past. Don't scare the child. Those distant times are long gone, and they have so many children of their own that they wouldn't know where to put them. Gwen considered that she might have invented the fortune teller herself. The miraculous rescues she experienced twice might simply be her heightened intuition. Nevertheless, she felt somewhat uneasy about recent events and the role she played as a witness. Later, she recalled her friend's words about the strangeness of what had happened and began to doubt her newfound beliefs. The fortune teller's face vividly appeared in her mind. She was certain that she would recognize that face among thousands if she encountered it in her life. She managed to calm her nerves and went to the train station in the evening, a place where gypsies often frequented. She noticed two gypsy women and approached them. They didn't resemble the fortune teller from her dream. The fortune tellers surrounded her, offering to predict her future. Then, the familiar voice whispered softly, Run. Gwen followed the voice's advice and ran away, leaving the surprised fortune tellers watching her. She stopped a short distance away, catching her breath. She looked back at where she had come from, but nothing happened. The two fortune tellers continued their activities, approaching passers-by. Everything around seemed calm. Gwen eventually headed back home and spent a long time pondering the events of the day. Late in the evening, a news report on TV featured the incident that Gwen and her friend had witnessed. It turned out that there were security cameras in the area, and the footage clearly showed the moment the driver crashed into the bus stop. The girls were not visible on the recordings. It was discovered that the driver was elderly and had suffered a heart attack. His life was not in danger now. Law enforcement urged both drivers and pedestrians to exercise caution. Gwen decided not to dwell on these strange events and instead focused on preparing for her upcoming exams. She was studying history at the university and had a strong desire to build a career in the field. She read historical books, enjoyed visiting museums, and had a deep interest in the history of her homeland. Soon, Gwen met a guy named Marcus. He was already in his fifth year at the Engineering Institute. They met at a student disco, and Gwen immediately liked this friendly and tall guy. It's worth noting that Gwen herself was quite a prominent figure. She was attractive and slim, and she was also a very intelligent and clever young woman. Over time, her studies and her relationship with Marcus pushed her thoughts about the fortune tellers into the background. Gwen even sought the help of a psychotherapist who explained the nature of her voices and other mythical, as he put it, nonsense in a simple and popular way. Gwen was reassured and began focusing on her numerous activities. 
Marcus introduced Gwen to his parents, and they were delighted with her. Marcus, his mother said one evening, we really like your Gwen. She's a good girl. It's evident that she's educated and well-mannered. Soon, Gwen turned 18, and her relationship with Marcus became even closer. Marcus's parents were fairly affluent, and they provided Marcus with money for renting an apartment. Gwen initially didn't want to rely on her parents, but under Marcus's persuasion, she agreed to live in a rented apartment, with the condition that once she finished her university studies, Marcus would be responsible for the rent since he would be working by then. Come on, don't be like that. Marcus laughed. Do you really think I'll be dependent on my parents my whole life? They like helping me, and it doesn't bother them at all. It doesn't bother them, but it does bother me. We're adults, and we could find jobs, Gwen responded. We could, but it might affect our studies. Let's make a deal. First, we focus on our education, and then we'll see about everything else. We'll have plenty of time to work later. All right, Gwen smiled. But only while we're still in school. They lived happily together, and Gwen agreed with Marcus that they would get married right after he finished his engineering degree. Marcus had only a few months of study left. It was April, and the trees were donning their colorful green attire. Gwen found joy in everything, even in the spring puddles. Gwen often noticed other girls looking at Marcus. They didn't hide their interest in him because he had something undeniably attractive about him. Marcus, in turn, enjoyed looking at the girls, although he knew Gwen didn't particularly like it. Are you jealous? He asked with a laugh. Of course, I am. Would you not be jealous if I were eyeing someone else? Gwen replied. I would be. But there's no need. I only love you. I only need you. One day, Gwen was sitting in a cafe. Suddenly, she felt a force compel her to get up, and the familiar voice said, Go home. Gwen had just spoken to Marcus a while ago, telling him that she would chat with her friend at the cafe and then visit her parents. She planned to return home very late. Her friend looked at Gwen with surprise and asked, Where are you going? We agreed to hang out and chat. Well, I'm sorry, but I forgot something important and I can't postpone it, Gwen replied. Her friend knew that Gwen never did anything without a reason, so she wished her luck. As Gwen walked home, she couldn't understand why she was doing this. She had left her friend, whom she wanted to talk to, and had not gone to her parents, who were waiting for her. She opened the door with her key and quietly entered her room. On her bed, her fiancé was engaged in a romantic encounter with another girl. Gwen grabbed her essentials and told him that she would come back for the rest later. Marcus knew Gwen's temperament well. He understood that this was a permanent farewell. Words were useless, so he remained silent. Gwen went home and told her parents everything. This is unbelievable. You were going to marry him. What would have happened after? Olivia exclaimed, filled with distress. Exactly what would have happened? He'd be fooling around while she cried her eyes out, Tom added. Right, honey, that you left. Don't worry, in time, you'll look back on this with a smile. Tom reassured his daughter. Gwen couldn't sleep all night. She realized that there were too many incidents that couldn't be explained by mere coincidence or her mild mental distress. No one had ever noticed anything strange about Gwen, except for the times when the fortune teller's voice echoed within her. But no one knew about that. Gwen thought once again that the fortune teller was not her enemy, and gradually, she began to calm down. Her parents were a great source of comfort, they surrounded her with care and attention. They even said that it was better to find out the truth before the wedding. If it had happened after the wedding, it would have been much worse. 
Gwen agreed and focused even more on her studies. Marcus made several attempts to reconcile with Gwen, but it was evident that he didn't believe she would forgive him. Most likely, his parents convinced him to make amends with Gwen. Eventually, Marcus realized that his relationship with Gwen had ended for good and stopped trying to win her back. After Gwen's painful breakup with Marcus, she remained single for almost a year. She saw Marcus in every potential partner, and a feeling of emptiness consumed her. She decided to occupy her mind and joined a table tennis club, read historical books, and resumed drawing. Gwen had been a talented artist since childhood. She started by drawing whatever came to her mind, but then she became fixated on the idea of recreating the fortune teller's face, which she remembered vividly. Gwen kept drawing, again and again, until she felt her drawing was close to the original. One evening, her mother saw the drawing and exclaimed, This looks exactly like my grandmother and your great-great-grandmother when they were young. Blood rushed to Gwen's face, and she asked, What do you mean? Was your great-grandmother a fortune teller? Where did you get that idea? Her mother was surprised. She had a twin sister, but she went somewhere with her boyfriend, and we lost track of her. About her boyfriend, her mother said after a moment's thought, he looked somewhat familiar. There was only one photograph of my grandmother with this boyfriend, and then she disappeared. Did you see an image of your great-grandmother when we were at the cemetery? You were only four years old at the time. Maybe her face is still in your memory? Gwen forced a smile and said that it could be possible. Her mother's grandmother was from Atlanta, and they did visit there once. Now Gwen remembered where she had seen the image of the fortune teller before. Olivia looked closely at Gwen and said, You seem a bit pale, dear. You need to go out more. Stop moping around. There are plenty of good guys out there. Maybe you've already found a boyfriend for me? Gwen smiled. Well, I hope you can handle that on your own, her mother replied seriously. Whether Gwen was truly tired of being alone or her mother's words had an effect, the next day Gwen started to notice guys around her and, within a week, found a replacement for Marcus. He was a refrigeration engineer who worked at a factory after graduating from the university. His name was Carl, and Gwen was captivated by his simplicity, sincerity, and kindness, which radiated from the young man. He looked at Gwen with adoration and was willing to do anything for her, even fetch a star from the sky. They started dating regularly. Gwen noticed that he was in a hurry to take their relationship to the next level and told him that she didn't want to rush things, as she had been burned once before. Carl was a very understanding guy and took her words to heart. He showered her with her favorite flowers, invited her to cafes and movies, and took her to the park. They enjoyed walking in the park and gradually grew closer to each other. One day, Gwen looked deeply into his eyes and asked him to look into hers, eye to eye. Gwen understood that he loved her. For some reason, she decided that eye contact was the most important thing for her. From that moment, their relationship progressed rapidly, and one day, Gwen mischievously looked into his eyes and told him that he could rent a place for a day for a more intimate encounter. It was an unforgettable day. The young couple couldn't get enough of each other. They laughed, joked, drank champagne, and exchanged sincere words of love. The next day, Gwen brought Carl to her home to introduce him to her parents. Carl made a good impression on Gwen's parents, and her mother even whispered to Gwen discreetly, Well, it's obvious from a mile away that he's a very decent young man. I certainly hope so, Mom. Gwen replied with a smile. Carl introduced Gwen to his own parents, who were ordinary working people and worked with him at the same factory. Gwen liked them for their straightforwardness and sincerity. Your parents are so warm-hearted. Now I understand why you're such a great guy. Yes, 
Gwen, I was always raised with love and harmony. I realize myself that my mom and dad are awesome. Carl laughed. A week later, Carl officially proposed to Gwen, and she accepted. Let's have a wonderful wedding, one to remember for a lifetime. Carl asked Gwen. I want a lot of people there, with relatives coming from afar. Okay, I'm not against it, but it can be quite expensive. That's not a problem, you know I have a good savings. Well, that settles it then. Gwen playfully said, giving Carl a nose kiss. The wedding was lively and joyful, and the young couple received the keys to a one-bedroom apartment as a gift, courtesy of Gwen's grandmother. Gwen and Carl, here's my apartment for you. Live there, renovate it, change the furniture, do whatever you want. It's yours now. I've already moved all my things out. Grandma, what about you? Gwen, I live at my country house. It's a warm home, as you well know. So live there and be happy. What a gift. The young couple rushed to thank and hug their joyful grandmother. The guests were moved to tears by this act of kindness, and then the celebration continued. The newlyweds were happy and went on a two-week honeymoon trip across Europe after the wedding. Later, they moved into the apartment that was gifted to them. The apartment was cozy and located in the heart of the city. A month later, Gwen told Carl that she was pregnant. This is amazing. I love you. He jumped around the room, celebrating like a child. Gwen's pregnancy went smoothly, and at the appointed time, they welcomed a baby boy, whom they named Jimmy. Carl turned out to be not only a wonderful husband, but also an excellent father. He enjoyed taking walks with the baby in his stroller and knew when and what to feed him Gwen could rely on her husband in this regard. She could leave her son with Carl for the whole day if she needed to attend to other matters. Gwen took an academic leave, even though her parents offered to help with the child. Gwen, continue your studies. Why do you need a break? It will be much harder to go back later, and you might forget everything. We'll help with the baby, don't worry. Thank you very much for the offer, but Carl and I decided that we would raise our baby ourselves. Of course, you are welcome to visit and spend time with your grandson, but beyond that, we'll handle things on our own. Well, do as you see fit. Our offer stands, and make sure to visit us, don't forget the grandparents. Oh, how grand that sounds. Tom smiled. Soon, Carl took out a mortgage for a new home. They sold their one-bedroom apartment and bought a three-bedroom one, not in the city center, but still in a very nice location. You guys are amazing. Their parents praised them. So young, yet so independent. We're so happy for you. It's such a joy when everything goes well for your children. It was autumn. On that day, heavy rain was pouring, and Gwen got caught in it. She thought she would quickly make it home, change her clothes, and everything would be fine. However, she caught a severe cold, and her temperature rose so high that she had to be admitted to the hospital. Gwen was delirious and, through her feverish state, saw the face of the fortune teller warning her about something. She struggled to get up but couldn't manage it. She felt that something had happened to her son. The crisis had passed, and Carl came to her with a worried expression. What's going on at home? How's Jimmy? Well, you see, Carl began, almost in tears. I was just distracted for a couple of minutes, and the older kids convinced him to go on the swings. He fell. What happened to him? Please, don't keep me waiting. Gwen cried. He injured his spine. He's in the hospital under medical supervision. I managed to escape here for just ten minutes. I'm coming with you. But you're not fully recovered yet. That doesn't matter. 
The most important thing is our son. Gwen didn't want to spend another minute in the hospital and wrote a note that she was leaving. From that moment on, all her thoughts were focused on her son. She kept vigil in the children's hospital in his room. Tests showed that the situation was serious and required urgent surgery. The boy's parents gave their consent for the operation. Don't worry, the doctor assured Gwen and Carl. These types of surgeries are performed all the time, so the results should be good. Oh, doctor, don't jinx it, please. Gwen immediately got nervous. Jinxing it is when you overthink and attract misfortune. I'm telling you, everything will be fine. How can we not worry? It's our child. We trust you. The operation took place the next day. The doctor came out and avoided eye contact, saying that there were some complications, but he hoped everything would be okay. Later, in the hospital corridor, Gwen and Carl accidentally overheard a conversation between two nurses. They shouldn't have entrusted their child to that doctor. He's inexperienced, and he's done very few of these surgeries. That's what I was thinking, too. Now the child will be disabled. Poor parents. Gwen and Carl were stunned and immediately rushed to confront these two nurses. What did you just say? Our child will be disabled? Are you talking about the boy who had surgery today? You must be mistaken. I was actually telling my colleague a story. What are you talking about? The nurses exchanged glances and, shrugging their shoulders, walked away. The parents rushed to the head of the department and demanded the truth. I can't tell you anything right now. The child is still coming out of anesthesia. The doctor avoided eye contact. Wait, everything will be known soon. But you promised us, you assured us that such surgeries were routine for you. And you guaranteed that our little one would be fine. I'm not a god, we're just doctors. We did what was within our power. Everything will be known later. Oh, you. You're even afraid to admit your mistakes. How could you entrust our child to an inexperienced surgeon? You're heartless. Gwen and Carl left the doctor's office in tears. A few days later, it was confirmed that Jimmy had become disabled. Gwen nearly fainted from this news. Carl, I don't understand how we're going to explain to him that he can no longer walk and run around the yard with the other kids, live his usual life. The life he was used to. Gwen cried. Carl comforted her, but he was on the verge of a breakdown himself. In this situation, he felt utterly powerless. The parents filed complaints with the police, the prosecutor's office, and contacted the hospital's management. Everywhere they were told they would investigate. Time passed, and no one could give them a clear answer. Various authorities began to respond, but the essence of all their responses was that the surgery had been performed properly, but the boy's injury had been too severe. Therefore, it was not possible to fully restore the function of his spine. After some time, Olivia and Carl were already pushing their son around the yard in a wheelchair specially designed for children with such conditions. Jimmy could turn his head, move his arms, but he couldn't stand up and walk. The devastated parents began searching for ways to treat their son, who had recently turned four. They were presented with numerous options and decided to have him undergo surgery again, this time in Washington, D.C. The hospital administration, feeling responsible for the botched surgery, did everything in their power to ensure that Jimmy was operated on in Washington, D.C. Of course, Washington. They have better specialists there than we do, and the equipment they have is something we can only dream of, the doctor said while signing the child's documents. I arranged everything with them, explained the situation, and asked them to admit the child. Relatives gathered money, and Gwen flew to Washington with the child. 
There, she had to book a hotel and wait for the medical examinations. A week later, they were told that the surgery was currently contraindicated for the child, as it could worsen his condition. The doctors advised waiting for a few months and then undergoing another examination. It's all my fault. If I hadn't fallen ill back then, none of this would have happened. I blame myself for this. Gwen said to her husband when they returned to their hometown. No, no one is to blame here. It's just a series of unfortunate events that led to our child's suffering. I blame myself too for not taking better care of him. And in general, we should have gone to Washington for the surgery right away instead of relying on our local doctors. Gwen often recalled that the fortune teller had warned her about the tragedy, but at the time, she was unconscious. She and Marcus took care of Jimmy. Gwen thought long and hard about the situation and came to the conclusion that only the fortune teller could help her. But days turned into nights, and there was no sign of the fortune teller. Gwen hesitated several times to tell her husband about the fortune teller, but feared he would think she was insane. She pondered day and night on how to get out of this difficult situation, but couldn't come up with anything. Six months later, Gwen took her son back to Washington for a reevaluation. Once again, they were told that the surgery was not advisable. At the moment, there is nothing more we can do, said the head doctor of the hospital. Don't lose hope, he's still young, and there might be an opportunity for surgery later on. You just need to be patient. How much longer do I have to wait? Gwen asked, on the verge of tears. I can't give you a precise answer to that question. Nobody can. It all depends on Jimmy's test results. When they're normal, only then can we admit him for surgery. I'm sorry. I have to see her. I'll ask her. This thought came to Gwen as the plane landed in her hometown. She thought about visiting her great-grandmother's grave, someone who, in her youth, looked so much like the fortune teller who often appeared in Gwen's dreams. For several weeks, Gwen had been contemplating this idea, and she finally decided to go to Atlanta, where her great-grandmother rested. She asked her husband to take five days of unpaid leave, claiming she needed to visit a friend in another city. Carl, can you take care of the child while I'm gone? You're okay with that, right? No, you know I'm not against it, her husband replied. He never delved into the details in such situations. He knew his wife wouldn't leave a sick child without good reason, but this time, he just asked, is everything okay? Are you sure you want to go there? You haven't been yourself for the past few days. Carl, please, don't ask questions. I promise I'll tell you everything later. Gwen didn't even tell her parents about her plans. The next day, she was on her way to the cemetery. It took considerable effort to locate her great-grandmother's grave, which had become overgrown with weeds. But it was indeed the right grave, and the image on it looked just like her great-grandmother. Gwen was astounded by how much her great-grandmother resembled the fortune teller. Gwen stood by the grave for a long time, but there were no hints or signs. She looked once more at the image of her great-grandmother and burst into tears. She cried long and bitterly, pouring out her sorrow. And even though she didn't believe it at first, a clear voice spoke to her. Look for me in the underpass. Gwen was taken aback and waited for more guidance, but nothing else came. She stayed in the town, booking a hotel. For three days, she tirelessly searched all the underground passages in the city. Yes, there were fortune tellers there, but none of them even remotely resembled her fortune teller. In a state of great confusion, she returned to her hometown, thinking that she would encounter the fortune teller there. Her husband had taken good care of their child. Hi, my sunshine. Gwen rushed into the room and hugged her son. Hi, mom. Well, how have you guys been without me? 
We manage just fine. Carl replied. Where would we go without you? Right, son. He tousled the child's hair. I missed you. The little boy reached out to Gwen. She sat down with him and said, I missed you so much, you have no idea. Very, very much. She hugged him and they playfully started laughing. Now, every evening, Gwen explored all the underground passages in her city. Day after day, she tirelessly searched for the fortune teller. A month passed, but there were no results. One day, on a trolley bus, she overheard a conversation between two young guys who were talking about some young people singing in an underground passage. They sang beautifully. Gwen asked the guys about this underground passage. Ah, that's over on Star Street. Do you know the new neighborhood? Yes, I do. Well, it's there, the guy smiled. Do you like music too? I love it. Especially when people sing along to a guitar. Oh, then you must hear this. You'll like it. Thank you. I'll make sure to check it out. The passage was on the outskirts of the city, a place Gwen had never been before. It was only on the third day that she saw these young people. They were indeed singing beautifully, but there was no fortune teller among them. Gwen was about to leave when she suddenly saw her fortune teller. The girl couldn't catch her breath, she nearly fainted. But she managed to pull herself together and walked over to her. The fortune teller was leaning against the wall, dressed exactly as Gwen remembered her, and her eyes were burning with an unusual fire. She said to Gwen, Stephen, North District. Gwen's head was spinning, and for a moment, she lost consciousness. When she opened her eyes, the fortune teller was gone. She asked the young people who were singing in the underground passage, Guys, the fortune teller was just here. Do you know where she went? The guys looked at her with confusion. There was no one here, especially not a fortune teller. We would have noticed right away. How are you feeling? Should we call an ambulance? No, thank you. I'm fine, Gwen replied to the guys. I'll be okay. Gwen rushed home and began researching about Stephen, but there were so many of them that she felt overwhelmed. There were no folk healers named Stephen in the North District. Gwen realized that she had to go to the North District herself. She asked her husband to take a week off, this time on her own expense. I really need to go, and I hope it's the last time, Gwen said. Carl looked at her in silence, but the next day, he took time off, and she set off. Gwen drove to the North District, realizing that having a car would make it easier to find the mysterious Stephen. She had only obtained her driver's license a year ago, but she had promised her husband that she would drive carefully. For several days, she roamed around the district. She met a dozen Stevens, but none of them were the right one. One day, she stopped near a village to take a break. It's all so strange, Gwen thought bitterly. I'm searching, but I don't even know who or what I'm looking for. There was a small football field nearby where boys were playing. One of the boys looked remarkably like her son, Jimmy. Gwen thought that in a few years, her Jimmy would also be playing with a soccer ball. She approached to watch the game. The boy who resembled her Jimmy found himself one-on-one -on -one with the goalkeeper but failed to score. One of the boys commented, Stephen, you're a weakling. Gwen's heart skipped a beat and she asked the boy to come over. She gave him a chocolate bar and began asking him about his family. He said his mom worked as a milkmaid and his dad was a rural paramedic. Where do you live? She asked the boy. I need to find your parents. It's just over there. Look, the boy waved his hand towards the nearby houses. We have a green fence and a yellow house. Thank you so much. And you're not a weakling. You'll get better with practice. 
She smiled at the boy and immediately went to find this paramedic named Carl, which was the same name as her husband. Strangely enough, his wife was named Gwen as well. Gwen felt like she was on the right path. Carl explained that he worked as a paramedic at the district hospital. Many people thank me for the right treatment, he said. You know, it's essential to choose the right treatment for the patient and never make a mistake. Gwen asked if he would consider seeing her child if there were spinal problems. Why not? Carl responded. Bring the child in. Are you not afraid? What is there to fear? Gwen asked, surprised. I'm also known for my use of alternative medicine, Carl said. Well, it's not exactly alternative. My grandmother was a folk healer, and she taught me how to use various herbs. You know, it has a very positive effect. After hearing this, Gwen had no doubts left. Three days later, she brought her husband and son to the folk healer. Carl spent several days collecting herbs and applied them to little Jimmy's spine. He then massaged the boy's body and gave him various herbal infusions. A few days later, the boy began to feel his legs. Carl continued the therapy and massaged the boy's legs. Within a week, Jimmy was standing on his own two feet and taking slow steps towards his parents. Oh my God! It's like a miracle! He's walking. Carl, look, our son is walking. Gwen couldn't hold back her tears. Thank you so much. I don't even know how to thank you. Carl looked at his namesake with tears in his eyes. I don't need anything in return, he said. Do you think I didn't feel joy and happiness when I saw that the child was getting better? It's the best reward to know that you've been able to help someone in this life. After spending a little more time with Carl, Gwen and her family left, happy and grateful to have found someone who could help their son walk again.